Since the age of 10, I had been acutely aware of Lucy Maud Montgomery as Presbyterian. I knew she must be Presbyterian because I searched out, read, and reread her books, especially the Anne books. When my family moved to the village of West Lorne in southwestern Ontario, my parents switched to the United Church. One block away stood the Presbyterian Church. Knox West Lorne was where I chose to go. The fact that I understood Montgomery to be Presbyterian was not the only reason for choosing Knox. It had an all-youth choir and a thriving Canadian girls in training, but the author's Presbyterian identity was one factor. More recently, in November 2017, I felt compelled to correct an error, a rare error, in a new market society newsletter in its account of a program on Montgomery and the First World War, the newsletter had referred to the author's husband as Anglican. My printed response read in part, Lucy Maud Montgomery's husband, Ewan MacDonald, was no Anglican minister. He was Presbyterian, as was Maud. Montgomery's status as a Presbyterian has always been a source of pride almost. 50 million readers may well have gained their impressions, if not their understanding, of Canadian Presbyterians from L.M. Montgomery. As a prime example, consider Anne of Green Gables, first published 110 years ago in 1908 and translated into 36 languages. There, the author presents Presbyterians <clears throat> in an engaging and perceptive way. Perhaps most notable, certainly to me, is Mrs. Allen, the charming, gracious minister's wife, a kindred spirit to Anne, someone who would be a Christian even if she could get to heaven without it. As Anne puts it, Mrs. Allen was my first dramatic role on the local stage. Why that casting, I wondered. I had the director informed me the appropriate voice for a minister's wife. Beyond this taster of Anne's anodine liniment flavored cake is the whole Avonlea community. The fictional Avonlea is based on Cavendish, the deep rooted Scottish Presbyterian community on the North shore of the Garden of the Gulf, Prince Edward Island. That's where Montgomery grew up, raised by her stern McNeil grandparents. Montgomery loved Cavendish. There, her most famous character, introduced as an unloved red-haired waif, flowers into a bright-spirited, loyal young woman, ready for the next bend in the road. Like Montgomery, Anne excels in language arts and elocution. These two things would have been prized by her community, a community steeped in the values of literacy and learning that the 16th century Scottish reformer John Knox promoted. Within the Presbyterian world of Avonlea, Anne finds a home she cherishes and a community that values her. If I had to sum up the life relevance of Anne of Green Gables, in one word, that word would be hope. In 1911, three years after readers first met Anne, Lucy Maud Montgomery became a Presbyterian minister's wife. She married Reverend Ewan MacDonald, who had preached at Cavendish. The marriage was less a union of kindred spirits, more a means to start a family, which Montgomery very much wanted to do. After MacDonald was called to Leesdale, east of Newmarket, Ontario, Montgomery left Cavendish to join him. The manse 
was the first place Montgomery could consider a home of her own, but even then the church owned it. Already famous for Anne of Green Gables and three more bestsellers, she ably fulfilled her minister's wife duties. As Jane Urquhart lists in an extraordinary Canadian's biography, Montgomery's obligations included bake sales, visits with the elderly and infirm, teas with the wives of church elders, rummage sales, Christmas bazaars, funerals, weddings, listening to husband's sermons, listening to husband's rants, care and feeding of visiting ministers, teaching Sunday school, wearing the appropriate clothing, hats, footwear, hairstyle, facial expression. To that I would add, <clears throat> directing Sunday school concerts and plays, visiting the families of 16 young men killed in the First World War, arranging for pulpit supply whenever her husband felt indisposed, and of course, attending numerous worship services, two every Sunday. Montgomery fitted the writing of 11 novels around such commitments. It was very much a Presbyterian milieu. And until early 1926, it was home. Impinging on life in rural Leesdale was the prospect of church union. Over a quarter century, Canadian Protestant churches explored the idea of merging. The movement was to culminate in the formation of the United Church of Canada on June 10, 1925. The new de denomination encompassed Methodists, Congregationalists, and Presbyterians, but not all Presbyterians. Two thirds of the Presbyterian Church folded into the United Church, one third opted not to. So by 1925, did the Creator of the Canadian icon, Anne, approve of a made in Canada church, a church founded on the notion that union was best for Canada and its perceived role as a Christian nation. The author of The Man from Glengarry, Presbyterian minister Ralph Connor certainly did. And what impact did union and the drive up to it have upon Montgomery, her family, and places she loved. To address these questions, I have delved into her detailed journals, her places of protest, editors Mary Rubio and Elizabeth Waterston called them, to find out what she thought and felt while diligently fulfilling her role as a minister's wife. In 1912, most local Presbyterian congregations and the presbyteries above them voted in favor of union. However, at the national level, General Assembly chose not to commit fully to the concept. Four years later, in 1916, General Assembly passed a resolution for the Presbyterian Church to unite with the other two denominations. With Canada heavily engaged in the First World War, though, the Assembly decided not to act until the war had ended. Montgomery wrote about the decision from the Leesdale Mance. <coughs> the General Assembly has voted for church union. I expected they would. But I feel bitterly on the subject. I have never been in favor of union, although Ewan is. 
But when the whole world is rent and torn, what matter another rending and tearing? Our old world is passed away forever, and I fear that those of us who have lived half our span therein will never feel wholly at home in the new. In 1921, the Presbyterian General Assembly decided to end the truce on union and move more deeply into it. The last General Assembly vote on union took place in June 1923. Just a year earlier, Montgomery had professed not to worry about the issue. She wrote, this union matter has been a dweller on my threshold for years, and now I'm just going to kick it out. However, when the 1923 General Assembly formally voted for union in the teeth of a large minority, she noted, she expressed grief from all points of view. I think it is a tragic blunder. The stately Presbyterian Church, with its noble history and inspiring traditions, has been forced to commit suicide. I feel that I have no longer a church. My Presbyterian church has gone. I owe and feel neither love nor allegiance to its hybrid, nameless successor without atmosphere, tradition, or personality. Montgomery, whose books reflect a strong sense of place, felt homeless. The notion that the new church would become the Church of Canada did not comfort her. How could the United Church be the Church of Canada, she argued in her journal, when as far back as 1906, Baptists and Anglicans had chosen not to enter negotiations. In July 1924, the House of Commons passed what Montgomery called the Coercion Bill, the United Church of Canada Act. Section 10 of the Act, however, provided for church members to take a vote within six months of the Act coming into effect. At a regularly called meeting, a congregation could confirm it would go union or opt out by majority vote. What did this mean for the National Presbyterian Church? In 1921, at least, the Presbyterian Church in Canada had the greatest strength of the three Canadian churches moving towards union. Of the total population of Canada, 16.4% called themselves Presbyterian. And what did union mean to individual churches, such as Leakesdale? Much was to happen at the local level before and after June 10, 1925. Montgomery's husband, Reverend Ewan MacDonald, had a two-point pastoral charge. Leesdale, where the manse was situated, had a relatively stable and harmonious congregation. Zephyr, on the other hand, was fractious. On May 22, 1922, Montgomery wrote, Union is in the air at Zephyr. She noted that while the Zephyr Presbyterian Church seemed to favor union in the abstract, much of the congregation was bitterly averse, as she put it, to uniting with Zephyr's Methodist Church. Yet on the local level, that was precisely what it could expect to do. Although Montgomery objected to union by fountain pen from the start, her husband, Ewan MacDonald, was not so certain. On August 24, 1924, however, the couple resolved the union issue between them. MacDonald announced he had decided to remain Presbyterian. I was glad to hear him say this, Montgomery recorded. She had told him she would, of course, support whatever path he took. As a minister's wife, she noted, there could be nothing else for me to do. McDonald's mental health affected his viewpoint. Since 1919, Montgomery had known 
that her husband suffered from religious melancholia, this kind of depression peculiar to Christians believing in predestination meant that MacDonald believed he was damned, not one of the elect. He felt that preaching hope of salvation to others was his punishment. Whenever he lapsed into melancholia, as happened in late fall, he turned unionist. He never has any energy then, observed Montgomery. Encounters with petty politicking unionists stiffened the couple's support for the anti-union cause. But on November 26, the McDonald's invited another minister and his family to supper. Till then, they had quite liked the Dyers. Reverend Dyer, however, had taken a union charge and had not only turned his coat, as Montgomery wrote, but like all renegades, was determined that everyone also should follow his example. Neither Montgomery nor her husband would be herded along the road by brash young ministers. On December 6, 1924, Montgomery predicted that Leesdale would vote Presbyterian, but she felt less sure about Zephyr. She noted that the Zephyr session favored union. These same men had blocked all efforts to strengthen and inspire the Zephyr Presbyterian congregation. They objected to prayer meetings, disapproved of the guild, and opposed Christmas trees, concerts, and the Sunday school diplomas Montgomery had introduced. Both congregations, as well as hundreds across Canada, would take a vote early in 1925. On January 8, 1925, Montgomery confided to her journal, I fear the island, Prince Edward Island, will go mainly Union. They are so far away from the center of things and do not understand the tremendous issues at stake. Montgomery understood all too well. I could weep my spirit from my eyes as I think of it, she penned. Both points of MacDonald's charge voted to remain Presbyterian. On January 13, Leesdale voted 63 to 11. On January 20, Zephyr opted out of Union 2, but with a much closer count, 23 to 18. MacDonald felt elated, and the couple's youngest son, Stuart, greeted the news with, hurrah, now we won't have to leave. Stuart is like me, Montgomery wrote. He gets deeply attached to his home spot and dreads the thought of being uprooted. I am sorry for it. So both congregations had voted to remain Presbyterian, but Montgomery doubted the Zephyrites would accept the results with goodwill. If even three families left to join the United Church, the small congregation might dissolve. That would leave Leesdale at loose ends, and we, she said, will have to move. A month later, on February 26, Montgomery journaled that she was literally obsessed by the Zephyr situation and the union mess. My intellect tells me it is nonsense to take it so seriously and presents a score of reasons why it need not worry me at all. But this has no effect on my feelings. Two days later, after an earthquake shook Leesdale and indeed much of Canada, she mused, earthquakes, eclipse of sun, disruption of the Presbyterian church. What further signs and wonders in this year of grace, 1925. Some union leaning ministers lost their churches when their congregations voted to remain Presbyterian. Until union took effect, these ministers, including Reverend Dyer, still attended presbytery meetings. They seem determined to destroy what they cannot carry with them, reported Montgomery. Rumors, suspicions, and bitterness abounded. Fulfilling her minister's wife duties, exposed Montgomery to unpleasantness. On March 18, she wrote, 
This was a Zephyr date, which means I am a discouraged creature tonight. She had attended a meeting of the Zephyr Women's Institute to present a paper. However, the undenominational institute was far from a haven from union stresses. The atmosphere she described as poisonous. She felt surrounded and inhibited by Methodists and sensed the resentment of the unionists like a tangible thing. While her husband canvassed Zephyr to determine the strength of his support, Montgomery monitored what was happening between unionists and Presbyterians across Canada. She recorded that the Ontario legislature had ruled that the Presbyterian church could retain Knox College in Toronto. This would be a better pill for the unionists, she observed. Later, also in April 1925, she wrote, Ooh, and came home from Toronto with good church news. 600 churches have already voted out, and a strong Presbyterian church in Canada is assured we will not belong to a mere sect. The general outlook is encouraging. A few weeks later, the Leesdale Women's Missionary Group dissolved. It then reorganized itself as an auxiliary of the continuing Presbyterian Church. Montgomery called it a disagreeable necessity. Meanwhile, Zephyr still brought Montgomery grief. One unionist of long standing was Ben Armstrong, a strident supporter with a vindictive streak. Another was Elder Will Lockie. Over the years, Lockie had used his generous givings to force the church not to take a business-like approach to its finances or to start groups such as prayer meetings and missionary societies. By so doing, he had weakened the church's likelihood of survival. Montgomery described the two men as our enemies simply because we have remained Presbyterian. The men had always been a divisive force. Then, on May 7, Montgomery reported that a Zephyr elder thought to be a reliable Presbyterian seemed to have gone union. Why? Jim Lockie objected to a woman stepping in to serve as church treasurer. MacDonald gave a gracious farewell to the Zephyr Unionists on June 8. Although Montgomery had expected to lose a number of Zephyr Presbyterians to union, she was shocked to learn who was going. Several members who had signed her husband's paper for support in April, Janet Myers among them, had in fact gone union. Is there any such thing as honor known to anyone in Zephyr? Montgomery railed. She went on to assert, not one of these people who are leaving are going because they sincerely believe that union will hasten the coming of the kingdom of God. Not one. We know the motives that have actuated everyone, and in not one case is it a right motive. As for Mrs. Myers, she returned to the Presbyterian fold once she learned that saving her husband's soul required more than going union. She had gone union in the mistaken belief that her husband would automatically become a member of the new denomination. He had attended but never joined the Presbyterian Church. Her goal was to get him to heaven. She fretted that unless he was a bona fide church member, he could not reach it. In any event, her daughter had objected vigorously to leaving the Leesdale Sunday School. Wednesday, June 10, 1925. That was what Montgomery called the fatal date. The date when the United Church of Canada came into being was, she wrote, when our beautiful Presbyterian Church is torn asunder by those who swore to protect and cherish her. Canadian newspapers saw the event rather differently. Their accounts hailed the institution of the United Church as a great birth. In her journal, Montgomery retorted, no, tis no birth. It is rather the wedding of two old churches, both of whom are too old to have offspring. 
Interestingly, Phyllis Earhart quotes this comment with respect at the very start of her 2014 book, A Church with the Soul of a Nation, Making and Remaking the United Church of Canada. Although church union went into effect across Canada on June 10, 1925, much of its impact had yet to be felt. Montgomery wrote, it is Leafsdale I am worried about. What will it do now? We have built up such a good church here. It was a miserable congregation when we came here, torn by feuds and cross purposes. Now it is harmonious and flourishing, full pews, lots of young people coming into it every year, all a church should be. But it is not strong enough to stand alone. On Sunday, June 14, the church in Leesdale was filled to the doors and Montgomery could report that so far she and her husband knew not one person was leaving. As for ex-Presbyterian Zephyrites, by July 6, she could note that only three had worshipped in Zephyr United the night before. It would seem that they are no better to go there than to their own of yore. She wrote me. As noted earlier, the loss of even a few families undermined Leesdale's viability. So in October, when a new couple that happened to be Presbyterian opened a store in Zephyr, Montgomery recorded it as an encouraging bit of news. There was talk of finding a different point in her husband's charge, perhaps Wick, maybe Mount Albert. But even if that happened, it still meant disruption. Presbyterians choose ministers based on a preach for the call. Any new church partner with Leesdale could not have called Reverend Dewan MacDonald. If that church already had a minister, members would likely prefer him. It seemed clear that life in Leesdale must end. I cannot bear the thought, Montgomery wrote. On October 16, 1925, Montgomery met Walter Bryden. Then at Woodville, it, sorry, then at Woodville, it was union, 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 she complained in her journal. The subject of union has more bite than that of missions, but I am horribly fed up with it too. Bryden was the new minister based some 26 miles away from Leesdale. Montgomery described him. He is a man of first-rate intellect and sees very clearly. His sizing up of the situation was masterly. Bryden was to play an instrumental role in providing the continuing Presbyterian church with its theological reason for being. He also served as a professor at Knox College and later as the college's principal. Meanwhile, Union was harming close longtime friendships. Montgomery's friend, Margaret Sterling, had joined the Union Church because her husband, Reverend John Sterling, had joined the Union Church. Margaret used to favor the anti-Union cause. Now I hear she out-unions the Unionists, wrote Montgomery. There will always hereafter be a subject we cannot discuss. I cannot joke to Margaret of Unionist ministers, and I will not of Presbyterian ministers. She will be in the same predicament, and half our fun will be gone. Montgomery compared the change in relationship to the 1919 death of her best friend, the Spanish flu. For some reason, he, the devil, could not kill Margaret as he did Fred so he just brewed up church union to spoil it. The McDonald's had served Leesdale and Zephyr Presbyterians for 15 years. That is a long time by Presbyterian standards, but it had suited Montgomery's need to feel settled and at home. By late 1925, though, change could not be avoided. I have long felt the coming change. Montgomery reflected, as one feels snow in the air before 
it comes. At an Uxbridge anniversary service, the anniversary preacher, Reverend Mr. McKay, talked to her, talked to Montgomery and her husband about a very nice charge at Norville and Union, west of Toronto. As interim moderator, McKay was looking for a minister to take the newly created charge. Union Church had remained Presbyterian. As for Norval Church, half the congregation had left to join the United Church, but half of another church, Mount Pleasant, came in when their church went Union. That left Norval as strong as ever. MacDonald agreed to, to preach for the call on December 20th. He came home from a weekend away, confident he would be invited to take the charge. By December 30, he got the call. The McDonald's prepared to move and say goodbye to Leesdale. So, as Elizabeth Waterston observes, the McDonald's benefited from church union. In her article, Lucy Mon Montgomery, Mistress of the Manse, Waterston notes, that the departure of so many Presbyterian ministers for the United Church meant that the continuing Presbyterians were short of incumbents. The call to the normal Presbyterian Church was a step up to a bigger congregation and a handsome manse. Montgomery might not have welcomed the change, but from about February 28, 1926 till 1935, the well-designed, attractive red brick manse, complete with electric lights, was the family's home. She wrote five books at Norval. Over time, she came to say, I have never loved any place so well save Cavendish. Cavendish, however, had changed it was a proud Presbyterian community, no longer. On Sunday, July 17, 1927, Montgomery attended the United Church, the term set in double quotation marks, in Cavendish. That building used to be the Presbyterian Church. Montgomery's ancestors had provided the land for the church, which stood right beside the McNeil family farm. Her grandfather and an uncle had served as elders there. As the current Cavendish United Church website notes, that was Montgomery's home church, where she had played the organ from 1903 to 1911, and where Anne of Green Gables would have attended. In an article about Montgomery and Scottish Presbyterian Agency in Canadian Culture, Mary Rubio wrote, the Presbyterian Church was the measure of her personal world. It is a bitter thing to me, Montgomery scored in her page, that there is no longer a Presbyterian church in the old historic congregation of Cavendish. Many of the people are bitterly discontented. They voted early for union, having been told by their minister that there would be no Presbyterian church for them to belong to. Some of them, have left the United Church altogether. And the old manse is gone. They're building a new one almost on the very edge of the road. The old site was much nicer in every way. In Ontario, though, the two Presbyterian manses where Montgomery lived and wrote have become national historic sites that draw people engaged, entertained, and empowered by Ellen Montgomery's writing. In March 2017, the Norval Manse made Smithsonian Institute news with the announcement it was now a museum. The historic Leesdale Church is now the base of the Lucy Mon Montgomery Society of Ontario, which offers teas, tours, and programs. Presbyterian congregations connected to Montgomery, Leesdale, Norval, and Union, remain active. But for Montgomery, the union movement had posed a threat to her very self, to her religious identity, 
As a member of a church of the 16th century Protestant Reformation, indeed the Scottish Reformation, founded on the ideas of the Scot John Knox and the theologian John Calvin of Geneva. Church Union had diminished the Presbyterian Church in Canada as an institution while offering in Montgomery's critical analysis only a faulty new premise. As she experienced it, the movement's success owed more to local foibles and false news than on any rallying to embrace a spiritual or national vision. Union undermined her need to be deeply rooted in her home and community. On October 30, 1925, she reflected, it has been my misfortune to be a born conservative, hater of change, and to live my life in a period when everything has been or is being turned topsy-turvy from the old religions down. In some sense, though, I would argue that Montgomery provided a countervailing force to Union. Even as the movement was gathering steam, Montgomery, the epitome of a literate, eloquent, critical thinking Presbyterian of Scottish descent, was creating books infused with the Scottish Presbyterian worldview, and people across the world were reading them. As Mary Rubio puts it, the Scottish Presbyterian legacy lives. It is encoded in Montgomery's texts, which themselves have traveled all over the world, wielding their own influence. For more than 50 million readers over the past 110 years, Avonlea is Presbyterian. And Anne of Green Gables, quoting poet Robert Browning, has the last word. God's in his heaven, all right with the world.